Um, and so we're, what we're looking for is the way ahead. What are the recommendations for policy around integrating migration into policy for South Australia? And lucky for us, we have some South Australian experts on our afternoon panel. Now, similar to the panel before afternoon tea, each speaker will get five or so minutes to speak. Um, I will ask them just to do that consecutively, and then we'll open it up to the floor for questions. Um, so if we might um, start, Brenton, with you, if you're okay with that. Oh, no prior warning. Okay. <laughs> um, that... Let me just quickly introduce Brenton to you. Um, he is our regional expert <laughs> on our panel this <laughs> afternoon. Um, <coughs> he is currently... His Worship Brenton Lewis, the Mayor of the rural city of Murray Bridge. I'm quite sure he's very disappointed that we didn't pick uh, Murray Bridge as the next big city. I thought I was I was reading for you, Brenton. Yeah, <laughs> Even uh, though I come from <laughs> from Mount Gambia. Um, Brenton was elected as Mayor of Murray Bridge in 2015 on the platform of Murray Bridge Proud, Safe and Progressive. Previously, uh, Brenton worked for the Regional Development Board of Australia um, and uh, so therefore is a real expert, having worked for the RDA around regional issues. Um, he strives to capitalise on investment in traction, therefore maximising economic development and community capacity in his region. And he is a champion for what migrants can do for regional and rural Australia. So off you go, uh, oh, thank Brenton. Thank you, Helen, too kind. Um, most of that's true. <laughs> um, and I spoke to John about his choice of Mount Gambier and he's having a rethink and by the end of the day, <laughs> he'll have that sorted out, won't you, John? Checks in the mail. Uh, yes, I did, I did decide to um, put my hand up for the position of the Mayor of the Rural City of Murray Bridge uh, last year, when all the state uh, local government elections were being held. I hadn't had a background in local politics uh, at all, but having worked in regional development, working with eight different councils in the Murraylands and the Riverland, I had a strong relationship with local government, and I understood what local government was trying to do as far as economic development was concerned in particular. So uh, when the position of mayor came up after a little while, I, I hadn't been planning to be the mayor. Uh, it, it was a late arrival in my mind, basically. I didn't want to, I didn't want to step back from regional development and leave um, so much capital that I'd build up and passion that I'd build up for the region to go, to go to waste and to be sitting around with a glass of red wine on a Sunday afternoon saying I should have, I could have, I wish I had have. Mm -hmm. So I put my hand up and got the job, and from then on in, it's just been uh, one great, one great thing that I've been doing, and I'm here today to actually be a strong advocate for migration into the regions. I can obviously speak about my region, but I can say clearly across the state, all regions look forward to positive growth through migration. We're very fortunate that we do have jobs, and. Uh, it's because of the job opportunity that we've been a strong attractant for migrants to come to the Murraylands region and Murray Bridge in particular. Through RDA, we pulled together 10 of the largest food companies within the region uh, of the Murraylands. And between them, they employ direct and indirect and flow on 6,000 people. Now that's about a third of our total workforce for a region uh, of about 36,000 people. So it's about a third of the total workforce. Um, the Murray Bridge itself has a population of 21,000. We've been growing, you can call it 2% per annum, pretty much uh, uh, year in, year out. And we did that through the GFC, and we did it through the Millennium Drought, where our river fell two metres in our part of the world, two metres below Lock 1, the river fell away, which decimated our dairy, our dairy industry and several other horticultural industries. However, uh, we still continue to have this strong growth amongst, in particular, those 10 companies. It's 10, there's more than 10, um, but the, they have uh, recently published a report, independently uh, compiled for them, which talks about 24.7% growth over the next five years between 10 companies. They're telling us they're going to continue to grow. They're producing food for the world, food for the nation, food for the world. Everything from poultry, pork, beef, mutton, mushrooms, potatoes, onions, carrots, Broccoli, it goes on, milk, milk products, grain, grain derived products. We are very, very fortunate in South Australia to have the Murraylands and Murray Bridge in particular. We will continue to grow 
and be a proud contributor to the City of Adelaide and the State of South Australia. Uh, so we would not be doing this without migration. In 2005, I saw 87 prime 457 visa holders come to our, come to our community. They couldn't speak English. They basically didn't know where they were. A lot of them had paid corruption money to even get selected. It's a long, sad story. Now we have 400 Chinese people in our community, and how good are they? As the Mayor of the Rural City since Australia Day, and including Australia Day, I've sworn in 200 new citizens. It's the greatest day ever. You little kids with their bow ties, spick and span, so proud. I addressed the, um, I won't say which school, one of our primary schools, the leaving class of our primary school, only a couple of weeks ago, 26 kiddies, and I chose to talk to them about the things I stood for when I ran for mayor, Murraybridge Proud, Murraybridge Safe, Murraybridge Progressive. And under Proud, I'd done my homework. Of 26 faces in the room, there's three that were fairly pale white, and the rest had a nice olive complexion, and from all over the world. So I said to these kids, um, under proud, we're nowhere near enough proud enough of what we do across a whole range of things, but in particular the food industry. We punch out $1.5 billion worth of value in our region out of, out of our 10 companies. And I said to these kids, if you've got a brother or a sister or a neighbour or a mum or a dad that work in our food industry, when you go home tonight, take the time to tell them how proud you are of them because they don't get told that anywhere enough. We just take what they do for granted. And these kids sat up in their seats. And the teacher walked me out of the car and she said, how did you pick that? I said, do you think I'm a bloody moron? <laughs> uh, it's not hard, but it's part of that pride. And we, I've lived in a, a community for a long time that said I wouldn't send my kid to work at the meat industry or the potato industry or the growing mushrooms. That's below what my kids will do. The reality is we need to turn that around. We need to be proud of those people. They are providing such a basic resource for value-adding our fantastic foods in this state for export interstate and internationally. So I'm damn proud of those people, very proud. We have 10% unemployed currently and 20 odd percent youth unemployed currently. You've got to ask yourself the question, what's going on here? We've got plenty of jobs and we've got lots of migrants coming to take them. Now we've probably chosen, and I've been listening to the other speakers, and I've certainly picked up on the fact that we need to be totally inclusive, and that's part of that pride thing. That's, that feeds into what you were saying earlier today. I think the new citizens are our ambassadors because they will take on that pride. They do believe in that. They can see the value, whereas we've been downgrading that simple effort. So there, there are a whole new range of ambassadors about our pride, our safety and our progressive nature of our community and that's how I intend to work with them. So for those that don't want to get on the wagon, there's not a lot I can do. For those that do, I can be totally supportive. We do need to free up some of the draconian rules around migration. The 457 visa holders really, I believe, have always had a pretty rough deal. The company that sponsors them has to do certain things and do so. But after that, they don't get a real good deal. And the ELTS test that was talked about and some of the questions and some of the things, the gate was opened, they were allowed to come in, then the gate closed, then we put up all these rules that they had to do to be able to stay here. Really, really tough stuff. Not fair. Not the way you should play the game. So we've chosen not to chase the humanitarian element, and I'm not ashamed of that. Because I've explained to you, we have high unemployment, we have a very high social index that we're not that comfortable with, uh, we have a lot of welfare. And so I didn't want to see humanitarian migrants come to the community who probably would not need to work or would not be allowed to work in some cases, then intermingle with the social recipients and be seen to be one group of unemployed people and battling away. Now if that's right or wrong, you can be the judge of that. We chose to be on the side of a, work, a workforce economy and we want to change our community from being just a working community that's growing at a good rate. We want to become a, a learning, earning community. We want to lift the whole bar. And these migrants, I can tell you, that same school that I went to seven years ago, as far as the new uh, test, um, what's it called? Um, that's it, thank you. It didn't rate too highly. 
I can tell you now it's off the Richter scale. It's improved out of sight. It's right up there. And the reason is the children that are going there are in the main are children of migrants who are at school every day. Every day. And they can't learn enough. They want to learn. They want to prosper. And that's so strong. And when I grew up as a child on the outskirts of Murray Bridge, our neighbours were Italian. They couldn't speak any English, not a word. My mother and father befriended them, helped them, as a lot of people have done in Murray Bridge with the new migrants from 50 odd different nations. We were friends and we're friends to this day. And that family went on and prospered. Their children have gone on and prospered and have improved our community out of sight. A lot of their kids have gone away through education and not come back, and some have come back. And those that have come back are really determined to make a difference. I think our current wave of migration will do exactly the same, and I really welcome it. Uh, the downside is currently, from a political point of view, the Premier might like to see some of our food companies do something in northern Adelaide, create a couple of hundred jobs here or there. I really detest that stuff. Leave our town alone, leave our city alone. We'll continue to grow. We'll do what we do. We don't need you to meddle with our community. So, you know, when, when I hear those things, I get a little bit, little bit upset because they, there's a lot they could do for us around support services for migration that they don't do. We have a migrant resource centres open two days a week. We had school migration officers and they got pulled 50% 50, 50 of the way through the program. They work with local businesses to identify the school shortages. No, no, no funding for that. So to the state government, my message is clear. Stay away. We'll do what we do. Uh, it, don't, don't hold us back. So that's, that's probably the, the one that I've thrown in just to stir people up a little bit, but I really feel that. So thanks very much. Thank you, uh, Brenton. We're going to move on down the table, and um, I apologise to Joe in advance because having despite practised your last name, I'm probably still going to get it wrong. This is Mr Joe Shazak. Nearly. <laughs> Who is the secretary of the SA Unions, which is a peak body for South Australian union movement, representing over 160,000 members and 27 trade unions. Uh, Joe is also a director of the statewide superannuation, and he's had extensive experience representing the interests of working people in both a legal, political and campaigning framework. If you'd like to welcome Joe. Look, I, I, um, thank you for um, having me today and firstly I'd, I'd like to recognise and acknowledge the traditional owners of the land of which we are all migrants upon. Um, and I think there's, uh, the irony is not lost on me to have a bloke that you can't pronounce his surname on a migration <laughs> panel. So, um, <laughs> I'll, and I'll probably talk a little bit about perhaps some of my family's experiences as migrants, as I know so many in this room are. But, um, uh, I think it's worth just start, stating unequivocally to start with that SA Unions, as stated, the peak body for the trade union movement in South Australia is, has been and always will be a firm supporter of migration in Australia and in South Australia in particular. We are a state of migrants. We are the free state, um, as I would always remind my colleagues from the east. And um, we're very proud of that. And we think that mm -hmm. a, a, um, a conversation, a policy conversation around around the context of migration, be it skilled, be it um, force five sevens, be it humanitarian intake, or be it in emerging um, environments such as the China Free Trade Agreement, uh, really are consuming the, the public consciousness at the moment. And I think that's going to be the case for many years to come. And it will take a lot of, a number of brave individuals, community leaders, politicians, uh, to really find a, a path through that where we minimise exploitation, minimise hysteria and maximise uh, community benefit. The other um, context of which is, is unavoidable in the discussion, and it was already raised today, and that's jobs. South Australia is doing it really tough at the moment. I don't need to tell anybody in this room just exactly what the state's facing. It's, um, got a massive economic transformation ahead of it um, around um, manufacturing, around new industries. We've got a, um, a high unemployment rate and an even higher youth unemployment rate. So people are understandably uh, worried about their jobs. 
it's not just people who are out of work who are, um, who are worried, but, but so many people that I speak to in workplaces uh, have long lost the idea that their job is secure. This idea of, and this, this, this um, phrase we, that we use, insecure employment, is really rife. We all know how many friends, families of ours skip from employment contract to employment contract. Once upon a time, public sector employment was seen to be tenured, whereas many, many of my contemporaries, people around my age in their early 30s, have been working for eight years, in ex or in excess of eight years, for the pu public sector, and have never had a permanent job. So people are understandably worried about, about their work. And we're, we're worried about the people who are undertaking that work. We're worried about um, temporary work visa holders, 457s, 417s, and the potential and real exploitation that those workers face. Um, it's already been raised about some of the rules around uh, 457 recipients and their ability to, ability to continue to participate in the South Australian economy after their circumstances have changed, and we firmly agree with that. Because SA Unions supports migration, we support people that migrate to our great state finding um, dignity in work, and we think that there is a risk to that through the exploitation of 457 visa holders. Across the country right now, just to put some context in this, there are 1.1 million 457 and 417 visa holders. That's a very big portion of our workforce. And we've seen recently through many forums, including um, Four Corners and Fairfax, a number of occasions, just what happens when uh, things go wrong with these workers. Many of you would have seen recently the case of 7-Eleven, where um, student visas, student visa holders in, in a number of those circumstances were exploited, working in cases double the hours for half the pay. And without preempting reviews that are currently taking place, it looks like that that was a, um, a systemic issue within the 7-Eleven franchise group. Um, the national um, chair of 7-Eleven, who was also the national chair of the Australian Institute of Company Directors, has stood down pending the investigation. We've got Alan Fells, who's a former um, federal bureaucrat, is in investigating this. And, and frankly, if anybody had have been speaking to the trade union movement about 7-Eleven, about exploited poultry workers, as we've seen in other media reports, uh, exploited um, labour hire employees, we would, in almost all occasions, draw your attention to the fact that these are vulnerable and exploited migrant workers. The, there's many opportunities, I think, within, um, within migration conversation within South Australia. And I just want to make it again very clear that, um, that South Australia is built upon migration. We are a state which relies heavily on small enterprise and small business, as well as government. We're a government town and we're a small business town, in, as far as I'm concerned. And recently I, and, I, and I'm sorry to, to not um, attribute the, the right reference here, but recently I read an article which, which said that, and, and, and highlighted that amongst the most on, entrepreneurial uh, groups of migrants to Australia and to South Australia have been humanitarian refugees, or refugees, humanitarian intake. And I think that's a really important note because so often in the discussion of migration, we separate out and silo the, con the conversations around skilled migration, around 457 visa holders, and about our humanitarian intake. I'd be very surprised if people in this room didn't at least know somebody, a refugee, who came to Australia with very significant skill sets, mm. with very significant qualifications, and frankly, biting at the bit to participate in our community and in our society. We've got a real concern that our current um, humanitarian intake frameworks do not facilitate, in, in most cases, prohibit work. We think that's counterproductive for those individuals involved, we think it's bad for our state, and we think it's horrible for our economy. There was this 
that was raised before about um, uh, perception at times of, of refugees in our community being um, welfare recipients in what is otherwise a really tough economy or being um, not needing to work. And I think that's just um, very unfair. I think most refugees that come to Australia are desperately trying to fit in, desperately trying to participate. And it is our rules and our framework as, um, as a country which is preventing that occurring. And I also think I couldn't, I can't within the context of us meeting today with the um, just heartbreaking situation in the Middle East and in Syria not say that we can do a hell of a lot better as a country in this space. I think that our conversation around asylum seekers has shifted so far. As the son of a refugee, um, yeah, my name's a giveaway, but um, as a son of a refugee who came, in, came to Australia in 1957 in a very, very different political and social context. And I speak to my dad often about his experiences and just how hard it was for him, but also how different it was for him um, than his contemporary refugees coming to Australia today. So I think as a country and as a state, we've got a big heart and we could do a hell of a lot better in that space. I also want to talk about some emerging um, risks that you may have seen the trade union movement speaking about recently, and that's the Chinese Free Trade Agreement. And in particular, um, what that means in terms of foreign labour in a uh, Australian job context. The, without, and I, and I pull me up if I become too political on this, and I'll do my best not to, but the, um, the ACTU estimates that um, should the China Free Trade Agreement be signed in an unamended form as currently sits, there are 158,000 Australians who have um, their jobs at risk. And that is on a, um, a very direct consequence of clauses which prohibit the federal government from um, labour market testing. Labour market testing is uh, what we all use uh, to show that uh, jobs that would be needed for a project are not available and therefore facilitate the 457 visa process as we currently know it. We think there is an, a massive risk here. And I'll go back to the, the, the point that I raised earlier. A massive risk, not for or but for our economy and, and not just for our, for our workers here, but for those what will be tens of thousands of workers who are facilitated into Australia through the China Free Trade Agreement who face significant risk of exploitation. Uh, we know that China is uh, one of the worst abusers of industrial and employment rights in the world. They have a less than um, proud record on human rights. And as the China Free Trade Agreement, Agreement currently sits, they would facilitate the importation of some of those less than favourable and exploitative process, practices within the workplace. We think that if the economy here and if the um, country here were to need that type of imported labour, then we've got existing frameworks that facilitate that through the 457 processes. We don't want to see migration in this country if people are going to be exploited. I think that's what it comes down to for us. We think that everybody um, finds dignity through work, Everybody finds their place in society through work and we think that a fair and safe job and a fair and safe workplace is the best way to achieve that. Thanks. Thanks, Joe. And moving along, uh, next is... Uh, Alex, do you want to go last? Yes? OK. <laughs> <laughs> Alex has got some research that he wants to talk about. So I will introduce Vicky Chapman, who is our Deputy State Liberal Leader. Uh, Vicky was born on Kangaroo Island, so she also has her heart in rural and regional Australia. Um, she's been a barrister and a solicitor from 1979 to 2011, uh, where she ran her own business. 
uh, and she has also served as the Liberal Party's executive, first as vice president from 1992 to 1995, and was the party's first female president. Vicky is currently the deputy state Liberal Leader and Shadow Attorney General, Shadow Minister for Infrastructure and Shadow Minister for Housing and Urban Development. Could you please welcome Vicky? Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I think I was invited uh, today uh, to um, uh, be part of this panel uh, in the Shadow Attorney role, but also because I have actually specifically had a role in Shadow for the Population uh, in the 13 years I've been in the Parliament. Uh, I did everything I possibly could to make sure I was thrown out of Parliament before the end of question time, so I had plenty of time to be with you. Uh, that wasn't difficult. It took about four minutes, actually. So, um, look, my uh, contribution, I hope, uh, will, will uh, target uh, what I think we're here to talk for, because you've been given an up update during the day. Uh, all of you, many of you, are specialists in the sort of migration area anyway, and or, uh, of course, academic and researchers. And I start simply with the premise uh, that, and, I, and I openly uh, confirm that I'm an advocate of the view that we do need to have population growth in South Australia, indeed in Australia, but we'll target on South Australia today, for the purposes of economic security uh, of our region. Uh, one simple answer to this, of course, would be to take over the Northern Territory and take back what we should have uh, kept in the first place. <laughs> uh, and I have some plans in that regard, but I won't share them with you today. Um, what I will uh, say, though, is that... Um, uh, of the migration factor in relation to population growth, uh, I just want to specifically uh, perhaps target uh, the issue of how we might attract uh, young, fit, preferably educated, ready to breed, ready to work people from around the world on a permanent basis. And that is not to diminish the refugee contribution to Australia, but it's minimal compared to A, what we need, and B, what current policy uh, provides not in any way to diminish the contribution some of those have made to the growth of Australia, uh, but uh, I'll just leave that aside for the moment. I'll leave aside uh, relative um, reunification, uh, uh, because again, that's relatively small uh, under Australian policy. Skilled migration uh, and the opportunity uh, to develop uh, temporary uh, working uh, migrants, 457s has been referred to, or, or other forms of migration, uh, and or those who are in a carer role pending the education of young people from other countries is the sort of area that I want to particularly target. As I say, it's not to diminish the others, uh, but I think they're pretty important. Uh, and how do we therefore uh, attract more of the share as, a, as under small state policies, which you know, come and go depending on who's in federal uh, power and, and what policy uh, directions are there and what benefits we might share with places like Tasmania uh, in, uh, in rural status and getting a higher access or slice of the migration share uh, depending on uh, our, uh, that status. Uh, for example, being prepared to be able to take people with a lesser uh, threshold of capacity in relation to English speaking and uh, literacy and numerous, uh, sorry, literacy uh, particularly, um, will um, mean that we can, you know, come and go a bit, ebb and flow in relation to the share of that. And I, and I can certainly talk about, probably today you've been updated on what current policies is, exist and what opportunities are there. Certainly the area of temporary work uh, is, you know, look, it's always controversial. In my lifetime it has, and Mark Glasbrook's, you know, just about as old as I am, but, you know, most of you are probably younger. But uh, I make the point that this is not something that's new. Uh, there's, there's always been controversy surrounding it. But in South Australia, if you haven't received this information already, the biggest employer in South Australia is the South Australian Government, and the biggest employer of temporary work placements particularly 457, v 457 visas, is the South Australian Government. They employ literally thousands of people in the health and care world, particularly, uh, to provide the services in hospital and clinical care that, that you enjoy. Uh, and frankly, uh, that part of the uh, government would hemorrhage into dysfunction overnight if those people uh, weren't here providing for it. So there is a valuable side uh, of, um, uh, of temporary place workmen. And obviously, uh, as Joe's pointed out, it's important to secure uh, you know, protection for those while they're here uh, and so on. But the things I want to particularly feature on is this. 
and I use uh, I use Kangaroo Island as an example because Matthew Flinders um, probably was the first offender of what I think should be a golden rule, and that is uh, if you want to attract people who have a reason to leave their country and a reason to come, preferably both, not just one or the other. We don't necessarily want people who just want to leave Greece because they can't get a job. They want to actually want to be able to come to here and make a commitment to come to South Australia and stay here. Uh, is there has to be honesty in what's here for them. And I use Matthew Flinders because, you know, um, he went back to England uh, in the early 1800s and wrote the reports, which would be, have to be the first spin documents that ever were written. Uh, the land of opportunity, the lush fields of Kangaroo Island, etc. And when the people all got on their boats under the South Australia Company Act and got out here, they found there was no water, that the island was a rock with a bit of dirt on it and not much else. Uh, and the colony failed to the extent of it being the capital of South Australia and obviously people went to some greener fields over here and we're here today. But I mention that because we've got to be honest, unless you're going to actually bring in convicts where there's a, you know, it's a one-way passage and it's an involuntary migration, then, uh, and you want people to stay and prosper and have opportunity, they've got to be told the truth in the first place. So cut crap on the spin, that's the first uh, requirement. Um, uh, second is to uh, make it, uh, be realistic about what opportunities there are for employment here because the next best thing to having somebody come here and then deciding to stay here, and we see them all happy faced and fresh faced at the citizenship ceremonies, etc., is to then encourage them to bring their brother or sister or cousin or some other relative out as a skilled person, not just because they want to bring out grandma or grandpa to look after their kids or to bring out you know, a parent because they're ageing. Uh, back without support in their country of origin. So I think these are absolutely critical to us having the capacity to keep people here. Um, and finally, can I say, in the electorate I represent, which is sort of Eastern Adelaide and Adelaide Hills, you know, Eurasia and so on, we were the uh, recipients um, of a number of children in the wave of uh, migrants that came to uh, Inverbrackey uh, about four years ago. And um, the children came up to the Uradla Primary School to be educated. They're very bright. In fact, I remember there was a little sort of six-year-old drawing a colouring in or something, and she was doing a beach scene. And I said, that's a really lovely blue. And she said, that's not blue, it's aqua, <laughs> in perfect English. I mean, these kids were not some sort of some backwater uneducated. These, they came from families who were highly skilled and highly educated uh, and had a capacity to contribute. And it devastated me to find that within a year, of each of those families securing their place in the community, they'd left the state. I mean, what happened there? What did we do? What did we fail to do to say, you're welcome and we want you to be part of our community and we want you to have a job opportunity, etc." cetera? I, I just found it staggering. And in fact, I, I took up a box of cherries one day to give to the children. The cherries up in the hills are about as big as apricots. They're pretty good, yeah, better than Murray Bridge, actually. So, <laughs> um, and it was only because the, the now Premier was the Minister of Education. I want to outdo him. Of course, he bought a pamphlet or something. So I, I completely won with the cherries. These children were munching into them. We had a great day. And I remember saying to him, look, if there's anything you can do, and then as the Minister for Education, it would be to say to then Premier Rand, take some action now. Most of these people will qualify uh, for uh, placement in our community and you would be mad not to get hold of them. It just seemed to me stupid, absolutely stupid. So we've had opportunities and let them go through our, through our fingers and so we really must uh, uh, capture the opportunity there. But the other thing in my lecture I have is, uh, and so I'm just speaking from the experience here, is that I have a number of uh, women particularly who rent or buy properties in Australia who are resident in other countries, who bring their children either to go to school or, or university and they come here under a carer permit as the parent. And their children might go to Linden Park Primary School and pay, I think they pay the education about $15,000 a year and a similar fee if you want to go across to the, uh, you know, the local college. So whether you pay public or private, you pay for education if you're a non-resident and you pay you know, heaps of money to go to university if you want a placement there. So sometimes these mothers come out here, they rent or buy a house uh, in my electorate uh, and dad moves back and forth or to Singapore or wherever they might come from. 
And we have a number of those people. And if those university students and, and the earlier primary and secondary students ultimately go on to university here and do a degree which currently qualifies them to be able to stay in Australia because it's a, a dedicated uh, profession or skill that we need, then that's great. Um, uh, and we, we can encourage them to stay on. Uh, the danger is that they enrol in a, in a qualification which then gets cut off the list. I remember at one stage hairdressers was on the list. I'm not quite sure why. Most of you blokes were either bald or going bald or had sh short haircuts anyway, so I didn't quite understand why we had a shortage of them, but apparently we did a few years ago and apparently they're now cut off the list. Uh, and I just say that uh, it is very important uh, that when governments make policy, it's a sort of third thing, that we actually have some continuity. So if they're coming here to do a skilled course that it continues and doesn't just get interrupted halfway through, or if they're qualifying for something on the way through and, and the, the powers that be change their mind, uh, they've got to remember they've got a whole lot of people in situ coming through. So be honest, be welcoming, and don't interrupt the programs that we offer uh, so that people are sacrificed on the way. That's my contribution. Thank you. And last but not least, my colleague, uh, Associate Professor Alex Riley, who not only is an adjunct to our research centre at the university, uh, but also works in the law school at the university. He is the director of the Public Law and Policy Research Centre uh, Unit there, and is also a member of the Work and Employment Regulation Research Specialisation Unit at the university. Alex. Thank you. I'm going to start broad and get narrow over just a few minutes. Um, and we've heard some fantastic uh, ideas about what migration is in the world and into Australia. And for me, the very first question about, well, what are we trying to do with migration in South Australia is, who are we? Who are we as a community? And to answer that question, we have to ask who we are at various levels. Who are we as people of the world? Who are we as a nation? Who are we as a state of South Australia within the nation? And who are we within our local communities? Because they all overlap and they all give us competing reasons uh, to prioritise some, parts, some types of migration over other types of migration. So I can't answer those questions now, but I think that has to be at the centre of any policy decision we make over migration. It affects whether we prioritise economic migration over um, migration that maybe somehow we think bolsters our community in other ways, or whether we have a migration program that is actually focused on the needs of others and not the needs of uh, our own community. And people will have very different answers to that question, who we are, and it will affect their um, views on how migration works. So just to give you an example, there are two extremes are, there's a lot of academics who talk about we should just open up borders. Free, free movement of people around the world. So a number of US academics in particular, Joseph Karenz being one, talks about we should just do that because that is the fair thing to do. In fact, if you go back to Rawlsian theory and we're all at the starting position where we didn't know which state we were born into, we would all choose to have a world where we could move, just in case we happened to be born into a state that um, was very poor and was in conflict or whatever. So from a theoretical, ethical point of view, you might argue we should just have free movement of people. At the other extreme, you have communitarian theorists like Michael Walzer, who talks about the idea that the political community is the central unit, that we, we all belong to a political community. And one of the main uh, rights of a community is to decide who's in and who's out. And so that, that gives you the idea of we, d we do determine uh, migration and it's, and it's the right of the political community to do that and there aren't open borders. Walter also says though, if you make a commitment to someone coming into commun your community, they should be full members. So Walter's not in favour of temporary migration for that reason. So what, what who are we uh, is going to uh, affect how we decide to um, prioritise migration. Now moving to South Australia, moving down a little bit further. What are the opportunities here for us? I think one of the problems and one of the difficulties of having a migration program on anything other than economic uh, needs for the community is it's very hard to choose people for any, uh, on any other basis. 
How do you choose people on the basis of their values or whether they're community-minded? I mean, do you interview them uh, and or, or not? Whereas economics has the beauty of, well, you've got this particular skill, you're going to bring this, this amount of uh, benefit to the economy and so on. So it's, it's, it's got a metric to it that makes it... Um, gives it a sort of an equality, I suppose, of, of co comparing people against each other. So if we then look at economics and we're, we're looking at, well, where should we be focusing our migration in South Australia economically? I think one way of looking at it is, well, what are the, the basic industries and the, and the basic um, uh, strengths that we have? And I think Brenton talked about the food industry, which is very strong. And uh, so that would be one that you might think, well, how can we support that? Education is clearly a strong ed uh, industry in South Australia, and I have a vested interest in that one. Um, technology. Uh, and so then how, how might we use migration to, uh, to assist there? And then that takes me then to labour migration. So how do you put together a labour migration policy? Again, there are competing factors and depending on your view of who we are in the world, you'll have different views on this. One, one issue is temporary versus permanent migration. Um, is it okay to bring people in temporarily for on four-year visas, for example, for the 457, seven-month visas for a seasonal worker who then might come back year after year? What are the ethical questions around doing that? Well, there are ethical questions. One is, um, is it okay to have people, in a way, permanently displaced from a place. If you're working here for four years and then you work for another four years and you're not, you're not given permanent residency, um, there's a question of whether you are an equal participant in that community. So there are questions around that. On the other hand, temporary migration has the benefit that states are prepared to bring in more temporary migrants than they are permanent migrants. So if you're looking at the global scheme, um, uh, we've, talk, we've heard about the importance of remittances for developing countries. Having the ability for workers to move and be employed in developed countries uh, is a form of uh, uh, can be in a form of assistance for their economies. So, if you're interested in open movement of people, temporary migration is really a, a way of facilitating that movement. So, there's questions there between temporary and permanent migration. Then there's skilled versus semi-skilled migration. At the moment, we only officially have uh, skilled. Um, temporary migration to Australia through the 457 program. We have one exception, which is the seasonal worker program. But then we do have a lot of migrants doing semi-skilled work through other means. And the working holidaymakers that um, Joe mentioned and international students are an example of that. So although they're here um, really for another purpose, work is part of, of what they do here. Um, another question in developing labour migration is, is, should it be supply driven or demand driven? And we've got, a, we've got a mixture of both in our, so should governments be determining, well this is what South Australia is going to look like in the future or what Australia is going to look like, these are our strengths, we should be targeting migration for those strengths into the future. Or do you let the, the industry and the economy determine what are the short term needs? So, and that's where we have uh, employer sponsored migration. And in fact, we've had a movement away from governments making that determination to employers making that determination through um, uh, uh, the sponsorship scheme and, and less just on the point system. And then there's also a question of the relationship between migration and local workers and what is our commitment to local workers. So if, there's a, if there is a demand for labour in industry, I think one question we should always be asking is, well, why aren't the local workers there? Are the local workers not there because they've gone off and had other fantastic opportunities or are the local workers not there because they haven't been sufficiently supported in their education and, and in their skills development so that they're ready to do that work? So that's a, that's a question that I think we always need to ask whenever we're deciding, let's bring in migrant labourers. Um, and, it's, and someone mentioned the, the, the brain drain earlier today. There's a real question around, well, why are we bringing doctors in from elsewhere? Why are we not training more doctors here? I mean, there's an economic cost and to us and an economic benefit in bringing someone who's already been um, educated, but there are questions around that. So. That's labour migration. And finally, just for 30 seconds... You've got um, 30 seconds. <laughs> my, uh, my research at the moment um, is looking at a lot of these questions, uh, particularly in the labour supply and horticulture. Uh, my colleague Joanna Howe and myself are looking with industry partners, uh, looking at 
a lot of those questions in relation to horticulture and so food production um, in Australia. And we're asking what is the right mix of local workers, migrant workers. When we look at the migrant workers who are working there, you have 457, so 417, so working holiday makers, international students, we have undocumented workers. A lot of that has come to light recently. Is there a way that we could do it better? And uh, one of the proposals we, we tentatively are putting forward is, is there a case for a semi-skilled uh, labour migration visa? that um, is open to um, uh, industries that have a demand for labour. Um, uh, that, so you don't qualify, 457 workers aren't the appropriate workers. And Australia is, a, is one of the few countries in the world that doesn't have a, a low-skilled uh, temporary labour migration scheme. Um, and I, I'm concerned that without having that kind of scheme, what happens is the work gets done by uh, working holiday makers and others that aren't properly regulated and protected in the workplace. So that's the motivation for our study. So I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thanks, Alex. <laughs> okay, and now it's over to you with the hard questions for the panel. Constance. Okay, sorry. I, I think the microphone's coming, Constance, if you want to just wait a sec. Now, I might have misheard or I might have uh, mistaken, but I got the impression that at some point Vicky Chapman was making a contrast between uh, the desirability of attracting people with skills who would settle and contribute and some doubts about uh, bringing out aged parents who might not be able to. And I'd just like to make two points about aged parents. First of all, that a major reason which some people leave Australia having migrated here is because they have been unable to bring out their aged parents and they have obligations to them. So that's number one. Number two is that nobody counts the contribution that aged parents make, enabling both parents to go to work so that they mind the children, so that they're known to be caring for the children rather than putting them out with strangers in a childcare facility if there is one, uh, and that uh, we should stop thinking of people's contribution entirely as being within the labour market. Uh, can I just clarify that? Because I'm sorry if I you know, gave the wrong impression there. Uh, there is family reunification migration and there is an opportunity from time to time to bring out your parents to help with babysitting, etc. In fact, I've helped a number of people do that uh, because even though they haven't fit into the boxes, uh, we've uh, tried to ensure that there's an opportunity for that so that others, in the, so as a family unit, they can actually make a huge contribution uh, and have opportunities of employment and education. So I'm certainly, I'm sorry, what I was really saying is, look, that's, that's a relatively small number, uh, as is the refugees. So I just wanted to, if I was talking about the permanent and working migration, I wasn't in any way wanting to diminish the value of the others, but they're in small number. So that's why I was simply saying, uh, I was dealing with the policies around the, the major cohort that we currently get and how the hell we get more of them to come and stay in South Australia. Stephen, and then, oh, sorry, at the back and then Stephen. <laughs> uh, if I just make a comment on, on the parent visa, it is a big issue. There's a lot of international migrants in Australia sending out a message, we want skilled migrants because of the economic benefit and they're really forgetting about the parents. Yeah. Um, Canada run a really good temporary parent visa program. Um, the, the issue that the government has, the federal government has with parents is the, the cost, the ongoing cost without the economic contribution, mm. which comes through modelling through Treasury. I'd also but, suggest that parents aren't a temporary thing. No. <laughs> no, but um, if there's the, the way that temporary program works in Canada and why they've been able to open it up, and it also works with the carer visa program, and they both have similar um, processing times, 20, 25 years type of thing. Um, is that if a parent doesn't get access to Medicare, for example, then the economic cost of them living in Australia is a lot lower, so you can let more, to, more come in to provide that benefit in terms of cultural, um, cultural issues and, and um, both parents being able to go out to work. So there's, you know, there might be merit in a program like that. Um, but I, I just wanted to... Um, so when you, could you just explain, Mark? Yeah. So it's temporary to the extent that they can only come in for a certain time? 
Is it what you're saying? It's a, it's an ongoing temporary visa, so it's almost oh, okay. it's there's no end date on it. It's just right. a, a temporary visa. Do you have to still be looking after the grandkids to stay qualify no. to stay? No, no, okay. it's um, just a, a visa. Once that you're in, you're you in. Won't yep. res- you won't get You don't. And there, there was something similar here. Previously, you don't get access to all the benefits that other citizens of the country would have, but you still can stay in there for an extended period. Uh, Australia ran a retirement visa program previously, and and that worked very well as well. But then they changed that to an investor retiree visa, and the numbers dropped (laughs) quite considerably. Um, But I I was interested um, in what Brenton was saying. But I'll just say first there, I'm not too old, Vicky. (laughs) But um, Brenton, what you were saying, I think that's a what's happening out at Murray Bridge is the blueprint for the future of South Australian migration. I think Mm. it is absolutely spot on. The semi-skilled migration program is a great opportunity. And currently there is some access to semi-skilled workers through a labour agreement program. And there's industry templates. They are good, but they are really challenging for industry. And the, the minimum salary requirements set at such a high level, which is over industry rates or over market salary rates, does cause some issues with that. But I'd be really interested to have a um, to hear your thoughts on the economic multiplier effect. A lot of vacancies, people are going out working in the regions, supporting the growth of industries, and you're talking about that opportunity to grow. Um, the, the state government's got their key economic priorities, and number two on that last year was growing agriculture and exporting to the world, which is great, but we need people to be able to grow it and then pick it and pack it and ship it. Um, so there's, there's some significant opportunities for the state, but without the right people to do the work, then there's going to be challenges. But everyone that goes to live in the regional areas is going to live in a house. They're going to drive a car. The kids are going to go to school. They're going to eat in the local restaurants. The, you know, the, that whole economic benefit, which then creates more jobs for the 10% unemployed, or it gives people an opportunity not just to work in farming or agriculture or meat processing. They've got opportunities to work in other areas of the community. So I'd be interested to see whether or not there's been a, uh, an increase in job opportunities for, for local people as a result of the uh, temporary migrants that have gone on to become permanent migrants that have gone on to be citizens. Oh, look, I think the basis, the fact that the businesses in general have been able to grow over the last decade, they've been able to continue to grow at a time when the terms of trade weren't that flash, you know, when the dollar was a dollar plus US. Um, some restrictions on certain markets that, that we're now getting more and more access to. Things have turned around, so um, I think agriculture's for a long time sat in the back seat and been stable but unrecognised. And, you know, we've had a lot around mining and a lot around defence, and we all know that. I don't need to even go any further on that. But right through it all, we've continued to um, beaver away at getting better at agricultural production, agricultural systems. But my region, and particularly Lower Murray, uh, is very, very good at food processing and manufacturing. Now, I don't live with my head stuck in the sand because I can see into the future that robotics uh, into the food industry will be a real threat. Now, currently, um, uh, I will drop Thomas Food's name, they're, they're looking at uh, doing some robotics on their lamb chain. They're now Australia's largest lamb exporter, and we should be very proud of that here in South Australia. But um, when I was asked for support as the mayor and also RDA, I cringed a bit. I said to Dave McKay, Dave, just bottom line, what's this mean and job losses? And he said, no, Brenton, we'll, we'll require approximately 200 more people because of the where we'll go with the next level of production and processing because of the robotics. Well, that's good this time round, but we know that robotics will, over time, take away some of those jobs that are currently being done by skilled and semi-skilled workers and we need to be prepared for that but it's about being innovative and i believe that the innovation that will come and i look at the average age of our migrants they're young they're young and and they just don't see the the hurdles that that we and generalists tend to see they they question why we aren't doing certain things and i can see them starting other businesses not necessarily related to the food industry um, in the region, and I, I'd like to quote a couple, but be, you know, because they're reasonably confidential, there's a couple under, underway at the moment looking at doing things, and they'll get there. A, they're innovative, they, they're risk takers, as has been said earlier today, and they don't see the negativity. They just can't see why can't you do it. They just see the opportunity. So um, I look forward to the next decade in, in South Australia, and particularly in, in my region. I think we're going to do some great things. 
And as long as the, our terms of trade remain attractive as they are currently, and look, the dollar can go up another six, seven cents even. We're still in the market, we're still there. So good times ahead. And I wasn't wanting to be too disparaging, but I do get peeved off with politics. And um, I don't want my manufacturers getting, you know, enticed to go and start a couple hundred jobs in Northern Adelaide at the moment. Um, we really don't get a lot of favours. We don't ask for a lot of favours, but we don't want to be fooled with either. We've been able to grow ourselves in our own way through dedication, large sums and large licks of investment, uh, the right attitude um, as a community. It just, we just want to get on and do what we do and get better at it. So I see great times ahead for South Australia in, in my region and being a contributor to the state economy. Thank you. And Stephen. I just want. Yep. You're right. You're right. Yeah, Is it on? Okay. I just wanted to come back to Alex's idea about um, temporary migration visas for semi-skilled work. Um, firstly, I'd like to say, I think there's a huge hypocrisy on the part of political leaders in many countries, particularly in Europe, who claim that there is no demand for lower-skilled or semi-skilled workers. In fact, there is a demand because as uh, economies get more and more uh, robotic, <laughs> as Brenton said. Um, you know, there, there are jobs that get left behind that people don't want to do. Mm -hmm. It's partly a matter of our social definition of jobs. We define care work as not being a skilled job. I think it is a very skilled job, mm -hmm. in fact, but that's another matter. But very few countries admit that they have these needs. And I think if we do have a program, we should also recognise that it's not a good idea to import temporary workers for needs that are permanent. Okay. Um, Agreed. I mean, the good thing about the Australian 457 visa system compared with other countries is that there is a path to permanence, which many countries don't have. But what I really wanted to ask Joe is, isn't it the case that 457 visa holders, although they're meant to be skilled, are often pushed into low-skilled jobs and, as you say, exploited in mm. such jobs. Look, absolutely. Um, and, I, and I think the, the, the major driving factor around that is their, their um, inability to have a, um, a loud voice or a collective voice because, obviously, within their program, they're tied, they're tied to certain criteria and um, we've seen both public as well as um, in my experience as a union leader, where workers have suffered the most atrocious um, living conditions, uh, common boarding, working jobs which they had no idea that they were going to be undertaking when they applied and um, came to Australia. And that was because in the first-hand experiences that, that have been put back to me was that they had no ability to stand up. Um, there was a, um, a regulator which they, th there wasn't a great deal of confidence in and, and we shared to a degree some of those concerns. But primarily it was because um, their, worker, their, their employer was their master and um, there were so many of these people in these circumstances. I, I agree with your, your proposition completely and I think it's almost universal amongst the panel that permanent migration, whether it be skilled or semi-skilled, uh, is good for South Australia. Fundamentally, it's good for the community, it's good for the economy. And on, that, on that basis that you, you put, and that is, these are permanent needs. If there are needs, they're, they're not going away. We're not getting any younger, we're not building any less, we're not growing any less, and um, despite some you know, economic issues we've got now, um, our economy's not going to be going to recession, recessionary environments anytime soon. Helen, if I could just add to that comment of Joe's. Through that report that's been commissioned by the food group, um, the Maryland's Food Alliance, uh, done by Brian Cunningham and Mark Macrod, very clearly the companies en masse indicated if there was an area that they could cut back on, it would be the, um, the subclass visas, the holiday worker type visas, uh, because they're very disruptive really. They're ba basically a six month stints they barely get somebody trained and into, the, into, the, into their factories and then they're gone. And they've got to start all over again. And the setup cost to get them into the factories around between three and $5,000 all up. 
And if there's any abuses in the system, it's most likely not so much the employers at all. It's the labour brokers that organise these people. And a lot of these people become labour brokers when they get here. They work out that they can get six or eight or ten other people and find a few houses and with three bed, four bedroom houses and put five or six people in them. And that does happen. But we can't blame the employers for that. In the main, the employers don't have a clue that's happening. Um, I personally own one domestic house and I only bought it because it's next door to a couple of commercial properties that I own. At one stage there were six lads living in there. They didn't have a television set. The lounge room had one big table and they all had their laptops and they tended to Skype and communicate. All hard working, all students. I went there regularly to fix up the toilet or the leaky shower or the door hinge or something. Got to know them a little bit, great people. But they lived really, really cheap. They saved every dollar they could. They repatriated money back, but most of them were saving up to go home to finish their studies in another country. And I don't, I don't have a problem with that. But when I look at the bigger picture, the, the macro picture of what we really want is what the companies are saying, they want families. They want families that are prepared to come and reside. And that's what we as a community would really encourage. However, in the overall strategy, there's a percentage that needs to come from the subclasses, but we'd rather see their minimum rather than maximum. I was just going to add to that conversation, which is um, effectively to support what you're saying and what you're saying, Stephen, because in Europe at the moment there are labour manufacturers or labour um, mediators who make enormous amount of money out of the vulnerability of people who are moving on short-term contracts. Yep. And the effect of that is that they set up a series of legislative attempts to stop that process. And in Germany, Czechoslovakia, Poland, what is happening particularly in the Eastern European states, is that the most of the money is actually being paid to the agents of those workers, mm. who are then finding themselves sacked at the point when the national legislation steps in to give them any security, and then they are repatriated to another country mm. to put onto another labour scheme as a semi-skilled worker because they are incredibly vulnerable. So under those circumstances, the idea of knowing who your workers are having relative permanence, and I'm not against seasonal workers, but the seasonal work can be regularised as well. And so the regularisation of a relationship to a community, which goes back to the claims about the, the critical communitarians that you were raising before, that is, the principle that sits behind it is about your relationships to others. And if you're just being driven around in different countries and being sacked on the, the fifth day of the last month that you are about to become you get a new salary raise, then I think we're in a different world. Mm. Mm, correct. Mm. Yes. Um, Vicky, I think you raised a good point before when you mentioned the families that leave Inverbracky and then um, have almost no job prospects and see either have friends in Melbourne and in Sydney or, or hear stories about Melbourne and Sydney and how easy it is to get a job there. And whether that's true or not, that doesn't prevent them from leaving. Um, and so I guess to me that begs the question that if we have places like Murray Bridge where you're saying there are a lot of um, job opportunities and we're getting a lot of those 457 visas and you did address it and, and said that at the moment your community is not... Um, you know, humanitarian visas is, is, is not really what you're after. But to me, that's the perfect fit. They're people that are here to stay. They're here with their family. They're wanting to put roots down. They want to work hard. And I guess my question is, you know, why can't we go down that path? Why do we so freely give away those four, five, seven visas when we've got a, a whole group of people who are yeah. desperate to put roots down I'll, and work really I'll hard? I'll try and answer that, if I can. From the humanitarian migrants, they have much higher needs. And if they've come from horrendous backgrounds, as a lot of them definitely have, um, and they're quite often not a family, as we might think of a family, it'd be a group of people put together and called a family. And they have a lot of trauma. They need a lot of support. They really need support. So if you don't... Like, we had some Buddhistan people into the community, a couple of families, it was horrendous, horrendous stories about how they got to be here in the first place and all the issues they had and the support that they needed, the counselling, the trauma counselling, the overall support was huge. And they were basically having to go to Adelaide to get it because it wasn't available in the rural and regional areas and that's pretty much the same across the state. So if you're going to have humanitarian 
migrants in the area, which is a good thing. We need to be very wary that we've got the right, the correct amount of support services in place for them day one. And it's even more important to get critical mass. So if you're going to have one or two Buddhistan families, we kept saying, give us 10 or a dozen or 15. Give us a number that we can work with where we've got critical mass, where they can be self-supporting and we can dedicate more knowing exactly what their needs are. So um, I think that's the message I want to leave with you. It's not that we are not that interested in them. We realise that they take extra, extra support and generally it's not available out in the rural and regional areas. That's why they cling to the cities. I don't know, yeah. Um, and I think that's an excellent explanation as to why, that the support's not there. Mm. Um, so I wonder, you know, what else, if, if those supports were in place, um, given you make those up, you know, upfront investments, they're not going to leave after four years. They're going to be yeah, you know, for the long haul. Right. So do you think right. your community, um, and I mean, you're obviously prepared, but do you think your community would be willing? I've got no doubt our community would be totally supportive. Uh, when the Afghanistan men first came to our community, it took a person to hang, hang himself off the electricity line for our community to realise the devastation that they are in and to stop and look and listen to say what is happening around us, how come we don't see this happening. It welded our community. We love our migrants, but it took that to bring us together. Um, our community will embrace the humanitarian people, but we are well aware, like I said, the Migrant Resource Centre is open two days a week, three days if we're lucky. Uh, we just don't get that funding support. We're too close to Adelaide. If, it's, if you want it, you can get it in Adelaide Attitude, and that's wrong. If you go to Mount Gambia, it's a little better because there's, the distance clearly says you can't get it over the hill. And that's why Mount Gambia in the South East Limestone Coast has been selected for a humanitarian um, posting, uh, more so. Uh, but originally it was the Riverland, the Limestone Coast and the Murraylands were the three areas that the state government considered most likely to be able to house humanitarian migrants. It's just morphed in the case of my region. We've morphed more towards the work, and you know, the economic migrant, I don't like the term, but it's been more logical for us. But you, our community would open up and take these people in. We had volunteer groups of 30 to 40 people working with the migrants back in the Afghanistan days, helping people just understand banking. Uh, if you got bitten by a spider, what do you do, you know? Little things that we that we think it's logical. It's not, Driving people lessons. don't know. Yeah. Driving lessons is a yeah. big one Driving where you get a huge amount of people support. People were getting ripped off. You have to do off. 500 hours. People so. were getting told by all sorts of brokers that Unless it cost three thousand dollars to get a driver's license, and they were f trying to find the money, saving up to pay for a driver's license. But the community stepped up and said, "That's bullshit." Mm. You know, so the community found ways to help these people, and I hear we say with our own unemployed, they can't get to work. These people walked to work to start with. Then they bought push bikes, and now, God help us, they got cars. They're terrible drivers. <laughs> Can I just add one thing, Madam Chair, to mm. the refugee issue, because I'd sort of left it aside in a contribution. Uh, I think the big mistake is to treat all refugees, humanitarian refugees, in the one category, as though they've all come from some desert country and eat beans and, you know, haven't had any education and can't speak English. The reality is they're very diverse. And my big um, sadness over the, a number of the people at Inverbrackie, because I'd met a number of them, is that they were highly educated, a number of these people, mm. and had uh, uh, tertiary qualifications. Yeah. And that's what just seemed to me tragic. I mean, the, the children could speak multiple languages, you know. I mean, it wasn't as though these were families that couldn't, uh, in my view, make a fairly immediate contribution to the ec economic and social fabric of South Australia. Mm. Uh, but also be able to, um, you know, wouldn't be a huge drain on our, you know, the, all the other services that are, are spoken of. Whereas across to people who are, uh, and some of them, go, I have a number of political refugees come to my electorate because they're isolated from communities if there's a friction in the, in the particular community. They're separated off and some of them come to a house and live in my area uh, for their own protection. And so, um, uh, as I say, it's, I think it's very important to sort of... Uh, yeah, and not, not treat them all the same. That, that's the other thing. And, um, I mean, I can remember when there was a, a wave of people came in from Vietnam. I was just in legal practice myself. I used to go down to Pennington to see some of these people. And, again, there was a huge diversity of qualification. And, uh, obviously, we had to develop ways of which they could be recognised, et cetera, et cetera. 
But can I just add one other thing in relation to youth? I mean, you four girls sitting there are probably the youngest in the room. Good mm -hmm. on you. Good luck to you. You know. But I make this point. Uh, you know, I've got uh, you know adult children, and they are. Uh, you know, look, one's lives in Sydney, one lives here. Lucky I've got some grandchildren here. But, you know, the, the reality is that our younger X, Y and now Z pop, you know, uh, generation uh, aren't um, looking to go into employment and stay in the same thing for 30 or 40 years. They, don't, they certainly won't be living in the same house or the same suburb or the same city. And I try and uh, explain this to some of my colleagues because it is important to understand that um, younger generations around the world have moved on and they're moving and they're on the move. And so uh, I think it's also something we, uh, in that sort of more mature generation, uh, actually have to come to grips with in making sure that when we are setting policy, we have this understanding that investment in training, for example, is a problem because uh, people will say, or institutions will say, well, what's the point in training on well, this because they're only going to be in it for a few years and then they're going to move on. Or as an employer, should I be putting investment into these people because you know, why should I take my share of it? And so you have to develop policies for people to share the load on the understanding that the people that we train or give experience to are, are going to be a benefit to somebody else. So there's, a, there's an employment movement um, and a, a social movement of young people far more than previous generations. And it's not going to change, just like we're not going to change young women like you uh, going out and having lots of children. It's not going to happen. Uh, we, we, you know, we, we, we need to appreciate that. We've taught you to be smarter than that. <laughs> Childbirth isn't easy. There's just one aspect that I didn't touch on and an aspect that I really want to leave this message clearly today is what I've seen with a lot of our migrants uh, that have come to our community they really put their hand up to volunteer. Mm. It's quite refreshing to volunteer to help others. And uh, it is something that uh, I'm so proud of and we want to continue to encourage every way we can. But you, know, you might not see that side of it too often, but in our community, I think it's a bit of a payback for some of the assistance that they found when they first arrived. And now there's a lot of people offering to volunteer. Brenton, do you, do you think that the um, integration of um, migrants in regional areas where they can become a more active member of the community is greater than bigger cities? I think so, because you basically can't disappear. You're pretty visible wherever you go. I'll give an example of, say, Lamaru, where the uh, Colcomoy area, where the McMahon family are fantastic people for bringing migrants into farming in the Mallee. And they're big operators. You know, they crop 20,000 acres. They run 2,000 sour piggery. They're big operators and good operators. They bring out skilled trained technicians um, for their, uh, their cattle breeding, their sheep breeding, their, their pork production. But they go the next step. They make them comfortable. They bring them into the community, they introduce them. They play bowls, you know, the, the, the footy club cooking barbecues. They bring them in in the right way. The community embraces them and you can't get them out of there. Like one family's up to its seventh child. They'll take over, nothing sure. And they're never gonna shift. They just love it. But it's the way they've been brought into the community. The sponsoring employer has done everything possible to make sure they're highly accepted. And it's the same when some of the local doctors come. To make sure they're introduced, we have a few barbecues, I and mean, we get them around, get them introduced. They feel welcome, that's everything. Uh, we don't do it well enough, but, but we do do it, and we can do it better. But look, overall, the answer is yes, they're, they're highly embraced. There is no redneck element. If I have a feeling in my community where I'm getting concerned, it's the indigenous people. They're getting left behind. Um, you know, I just see a bit of a vacuum there where they're more social welfare dependent than they probably should be. And they've got into that way of life and we're trying very hard to make sure we move as many as we can into the mainstream. You know, as youth go to school and play sport, that's pretty good. But if it drops off after that, you're in deep trouble. And it's trying to capture that drop off point with indigenous kids that's a worry for me. I'm more concerned about that than I am about, you know, our migrants fitting into the community. You know, if you pulled up at Murray Bridge at 3.30 today and watched the kids walking out of the high school, they'll be walking as mates, all, all shapes, sizes, colours. You just feel it. 
It's very well, very well accepted. If I, sorry, if I could just add just really quickly, I think the question of community um, is symptomatic of a greater um, social question here. And it, I think that goes right across the board, migrant or otherwise. I grew up in a street where we always used to laugh that it was the, the, the Royal Park United Nations. We had Ukrainians, I was the Hungarian family, Italians, Greeks, and everyone here and far between. Um, and it wasn't community based upon ethnicity, it was community based upon common social need, yeah. common social good. And that still exists to this day. I live five minutes down the road and I wouldn't live anywhere else in the world. Mm. Um, and our breakdown in community is not something that is just affecting our migrants, but it's affecting, I think, um, members of our community, and particularly the most, the most vulnerable members of our community are really falling through the social fabric and the social uh, infrastructure that we had uh, in generations or decades past. Any more Do questions? <laughs> he should. Sorry um, if this isn't very, very eloquent, but nine to five is a big ask for students. Um, <laughs> what I want to ask maybe ties through the whole day and, and some of the previous panel members might be able to um, help. Yesterday, an execrable news source, news.com.au, put out a <laughs> poll that said how many um, refugees should Australia be taking? And more than 50% of the respondents said none. And the type of people who use news.com.au as not their quite main so news... so surprising. Mm. <laughs> yeah, but, you know, that's the reality. A lot of people who don't rely on print or mainstream media, you know, that is a large part of our population and community. Um, and I think the people in this room are fairly well aligned and, and uh, agree. But what is it that we can do to, I don't want to say we're right and they're wrong, but to educate the mass of the population to mm. get everyone on the same team, to stop the fear mongering mm. and to start from the, the community to get um, upwards motion and, and sort of mm. more rights for refugees and a more mm. profitable system? I'm, I might just butt in here with an example of where I've seen that work very, very successfully, using an example from Narracourt, um, which has a very large population of migrants that have moved in, hundreds of migrants into a town of about 7,000 people. Um, so it's been a big cultural shift. And yes, there is a cohort of people who think that's wonderful, who can see the benefits of that, who are business owners, who own homes that are now fully rented, um, and are having a good time with those migrants there and accept them readily. But there was also an undercurrent of people who are less willing to accept change. However, they, had a very pro they have a very progressive mayor and a very progressive council that knew they had to act and squash any of the malcontent that was happening in their community. And they did that in lots of ways. Community barbecues, holding events, uh, um, Har Harmony Day and things like that so that it could enable integration. They did it through the schools where children will naturally integrate uh, together. But one event that they held was a film night in the local town hall which showed the film about the Blue Sea. It's about the uh, people who take a boat, uh, the, the people who've come by boat to Australia which prompted one young Afghani man who was in his early 20s to stand up in front of several hundred people at the front of that hall and tell his story about why he came to Australia and how he got here. And that did more to change community sentiment in that town, to understand the human perspective, to see a face at the front of that, to hear a story that made it meaningful. And I don't think that's any different than the picture we've had of the small child on the Turkish beach. It gives you that human element that people often need to be able to connect with the facts and the figures and the processes behind what they're hearing. Thanks. I I think it's a very valuable point, and it's not just on humanitarian migration. It's, I think it's across the board when it comes to migration as a whole. Um, I've been involved in the migration industry for about 18 years, and um, I've spoken with thousands of migrants throughout that time, and through my business, we've, we've assisted over 25,000 people migrate to South Australia. And you know, we hear at the coalface, we hear some of the challenges, and it's not just around humanitarian. 
I'd hate to hold a 457 visa because it seems like the whole world's against 457 visa holders, mm. despite the, uh, you know, the, the significant benefit that they provide to the, to the South Australian economy, whether it's doctors or nurses or... I think number three on the list is university um, visiting lecturers. So it's, um, there's a lot of top-end people that come in under the 457 program. I think the average salary of someone on a 457 visa is about $90,000. So it's not a school leavers type of, type of job. But I think the, the, the value of migration to the state is, is really undervalued. And the contribution, whether it's economic contribution or whether it's humanitarian entrance coming in, you know, everyone's a, pretty much a descendant of a migrant at one stage or another. But you meet a lot of people that say, we don't want any more people. They're coming here. They're taking our jobs. Yeah or whatever it may be, I, I think it's important that there's a, a really broad discussion and, and research done about the benefits of migration, whether it's humanitarian or economic or semi-skilled or, you know, what, what is the numbers? Do we need more humanitarian? Can we, have we got the capacity for more humanitarian, you know, whether it's skilled? So it's a, a very important um, question. And I think the research that's being started by the, by the university is very important. Just one observation that I can make, and you met the, that I think the line that resonated with me was they're coming for our jobs, they're taking our jobs. Um, my, I, my son's five months old and he's just started in his local play group um, down the road from us. In that group, at least half of the people are um, first generation Australians. We've got a number of African refugees, Middle Eastern refugees. Um, my son is too young, just a bit too young at five months old to fear that his job's going to be <laughs> in threat, under threat. And that's why I can't overstate the importance of everybody who believes in a more compassionate approach to asylum seekers or a compassionate approach to the way that we um, participate in the public narrative around uh, migration, how important it is for each of those individuals to be part of the solution, mm. how important it is for each person to feel that they're part of the solution. The more people we speak to, the more conversations we have with people that don't share our view around this, the better society and the better country we're going to be in. Because my son will grow up with his mates in that playgroup. They're not going to be migrants. They're not going to be refugees. They're going to be kids down the road that he'll know from his first name, from his first birthday. The difficulty is what you, what you see in the media and what you hear in the media. And, you know, there's various people that come out and have their opinions on different visas and you know, the, the economic multiplier effect of migration is very important. Um, you know, there, there's never been any economic research or there's never been any research done in South Australia about the benefit of migration. And I think it's, it's well over well over. Where were you this morning? <laughs> yeah, no, I, I've been sitting here. And um, yeah, look, it's really important. And uh, I think if you speak to industry, industry saying, especially in regional areas around farming and agriculture and aquaculture, you know, just all these different areas, there's hundreds, well, there's thousands of jobs and thousands of vacancies. So if people come in from overseas and work in those areas, it's going to create an, an enormous economic benefit to the state. That's going to create jobs, whether it's in construction or the automotive industry or the retail sector or hospitality. So it's not just about the migrants that are coming here, it's about that net benefit that's going to be created to the state and the, and the, the legacy of that in terms of economic growth. When you look at migration to South Australia, 14,800 people last year. The total population growth of Australia last year was 330,000. South Australia was 14,800. Mm -hmm. So it's a very, very small percentage. If you look at the difference between the top four states and the bottom four states and territories, Western Australia, uh, Queensland, New South Wales and Victoria, their population growth was 310,000. At the same time, South Australia, Tassie, ACT and the Northern Territory grew by 20,000. Um, the current structure of the migration <coughs> program just doesn't suit the needs of South Australia or other regional or economically challenged jurisdictions of Australia. So, yes, we've got all these great draw and, and factors which would really encourage people to come and live here. It's a great place. But unless we have the right policy settings, we're never going to be able to address some of the demands that we're facing in terms of regional communities. We need people in our regions. We need to be able to support the um, retention, of, uh, retention of essential services. We're not going to see that if we have diminishing populations, population numbers. So, 
I think economic research, or just, I shouldn't say economic research, just research into this is vitally important. So um, just because we're, you know, running out of time. Yeah, we are well, running out of time. Can I just so ask, is there, last comment. That, because, I, I mean, I'm interested. I mean, I, somebody from Panama recently contacted me and said, well, look, since we resumed ownership of the Panama Canal, uh, we're in the Panama government, we give people a free house if they come and live with us, even if they're old. <laughs> Make the point. I'm in your category, Dale, don't worry. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, uh, because they want their retirement income spent in that country. So there are, you know, ideas out there to bring people uh, to their country. I think everyone in this room agrees that migration is important and, secondly, it's necessary. Uh, but can I make the point to the la young lady who raised the question? Um, if we have a, uh, a, sense, uh, you know, a survey of the people who want capital punishment, overwhelmingly, always, it is more who want to bring back the death penalty. Uh, you, you, I suppose you have to have some faith that those of us who are in public office uh, you know, in all sides of politics, are not going to be pursuing that. So you will always have people who uh, make judgments or answer surveys that, that support that sort of thing, uh, or you know, dominate the airways or talk back radio, aren't necessarily reflective of the whole of the community. So um, don't despair. And don't read the comments on news.com either. <laughs> uh, I give that up. Yeah. OK, I was supposed to spend 10 minutes summarising up the whole day and I realise that I'm standing between all of you and a drink and my 10 minutes have been used. So I'm going to sum it up in one sentence instead because I can be succinct. Um, I just wanted to come back to this idea we had at the beginning of the day that migration, the paradigm of migration has changed dramatically. It is a whole new game. It is a whole new theory now, and we need to adapt to that. And I want to come back to something that Paul said. Because of those dramatic changes in what we're seeing in how migration plays out, we see to change the debate that we're having. We need to look at the core principles that form the foundation of any population policy before we can start talking about what visa categories we need. What sort of numbers do we need? Do we want more humanitarians? What mix of migrants we need? We need to go back to those core principles and understand who we are, what we want as a society, and then move forward from there. So if you can take that thought away and think about how you're going to contribute to that debate, and we hope to see you next year when we talk about something else to do with migration at our update. Thank you all for coming. Thank you.